Good afternoon, everybody. So I'm Charles Small, and I have the, the distinct privilege to introduce William Kohlbrenner to you. Bill is the um, Director of Academic Development for ISGAP. He joined us a few months ago, and we're honored that he is with the ISGAP team. William, in addition to working with ISGAP, is a professor of English literature at Bar Ilan University. He was trained and educated at Columbia and Oxford universities. Um, he has written scholarly books on the author of Paradise Lost, John Milton, the 18th century proto-feminist, Mary Astell, and Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik. Uh, he's also worked extensively on the genealogy, the sort of ideas associated with anti-Semitism in the woke academia. Um, with his new role, Colbrenner writes, and I'm quoting him, uh, no, nah, I won't go into the whole quote, but it's good. <laughs> anyway, so Bill is joining us today, and I, he does amazing work on these very issues um, that the <coughs> seminar series is based on. It's the, we're tasking ourselves as trying to create a conceptual framework to understand contemporary anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. Bill, the floor is yours, and thank you for being here. Well, thank you so much, Charles, and <clears throat> I like the way you're framing the talk, that Really, all the talks that we're going to be giving as part of this seminar are addressing a similar, the same question from different perspectives. So today, um, as Charles mentioned, we'll be looking at anti-Semitism's old and new, and I'll share a screen with you. Um, and we can start with an image that may be familiar to many of you. For, please, you'll have to please forgive my PowerPoint illiteracy. It's not going to be a seamless uh, uh, slideshow, but you'll see the images. Um, has anybody seen this image in person? This is from the Strasbourg Cathedral. And there, this is actually a genre of a certain kind of uh, sculpture. It was from inside the cathedral. Now it's in the museum across the street. It's called uh, a Iglesia of a Synagoga church and synagogue. So as I instruct my students at Bar Ilan, images are also things to be read, text to be read. So let's just very briefly together kind of read this image. Of course, on your screen, uh, ecclesia is on the left, church and synagogue is on the right. So first of all, what's distinctive about the, the image on the left? Please feel free, make believe it's a classroom. The cross of uh, the uh, the cross, obviously. Yes. So well, well, there's the cross, and it's not only the cross; it's the stature of the woman, the crown on her head, the almost I, I think not almost, but the triumphant stature of the woman, um, the 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 um, cup in her hand, which is obviously connected in some sense with Christian ritual. And how do we compare her with the image on the right, synagogue? We don't have to compare first. Let's just describe. Let's just describe synagogue. Okay. So the synagogue, because we lived in Strasbourg for a long time, mm. she's blindfolded. Mm. Key. Well, she's okay. So she's blindfolded. We also see graphically where we have this upright image of church. Whatever she's holding, if it was some kind of arrow, some kind of weapon, it's bent now and not even bent, it's broken. So she's blindfolded. And of course, from a Christian perspective, this blindfolding means that the Jews cannot see. The extraordinary thing about Christianity, I've just finished teaching uh, Paul and Augustine to my students, is their one of their primary achievements really is, is telling Jews that they don't know how to read their own texts right? They, they say you don't even know how to read your scriptures, because if you knew how to read your scriptures properly, then you'd be a Christian, because that's the right way of reading. So that's why not only is she blindfolded, but the book is held down. The book is held down, that's her left hand, and closed. I once um, co-taught a class with Giles Frazier, who is a, a, was a deacon at St. Paul's, is in the Anglican Church, and he was appalled by this image. Um, I, I actually find, even though there obviously are these very stark contrasts, I find some kind of comfort in it that they are actually represented as sisters. So there still is that kind of affiliation. Of course, with that said, and, and I, you probably can tell me the date, I don't recall it, um, is 
1394, all the Jews of Strasbourg were round up, round up and killed, you know, in about the same time as this church is being built. So notwithstanding the fact that they're sisters, this was a time, as always in Jewish history, of violence against the Jews. It's not very important also to know this, because we have, I, I think, a lot of our population, scholars for me, students, they think like the Holocaust was somehow a one-off, right? Everything was great for the Jews, then there was the Holocaust, and now everything is great in America, right? <laughs> 1985 in America was not 1783 in Poland, right? We have lived a history of persecution, and it's important just to remind ourselves of our story. Um, so we started with that, and we'll really be talking today just as an introduction about two kinds of anti-Semitism. One is associated with the Apostle Paul, universalist anti-Semitism, and one, well, associated with a lot of other people, we'll look at a, a passage by Luther. And we'll, let's look at these two passages first, and then I will show you contemporary manifestations of each one, okay? So Paul, in a letter to the Galatians, and please, since this is a class, and I know I'm going not super fast, but we're moving, if anybody has any questions, I can't read the chat, forget that, right? That's too complicated for me. So call out or else should I have something, if something comes up, you can read it and, and interrupt me, okay? If there's a question of like, I'm not making sense, questions about content and argument, we'll, we'll do together at the end. Okay, so this, so this is from Paul, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Now, what's behind this comment? I mean, Paul's religion, the religion that Paul really creates, um, it's not Paul, it's not Jesus that creates Christianity, it's Paul, who was, of course, Shaul, who studied with Rabban Gamliel and had that conversion moment. So Paul takes the particular particularism of Judaism and he universalizes it. You hear what I'm saying? Yeah. That obviously Judaism is based upon a particularism. We are the chosen people. So Paul creates a Christianity which universalizes the message of the Hebrew scripture. Of course, it changes the temporal frame. It introduces a new character. But this becomes a universal religion now. I mean, there was a, a, a discussion, and it's important to know about whether or not what Christians call the Old Testament should be included in their Bible. And there were two parties. Augustine was one. He won in the end. The other was, was a group called the Manichaeans. And the Manichaeans said, we're much better without this. We're much better without this, these sacred works. So, very interesting, right? And the, re, and, and the Manichaeans had something to say, really, because Paul had to reread all of the Hebrew scriptures in order for it to be coherent. The Manichaeans say... What, that's not, that's not me, I don't think, no. Uh, the Manichaeans say, what's this about a chosen people, right? And, and Augustine's Christianity has to find a way of accommodating the particularity of Judaism as it's giving this universal message. So this, now, this doesn't really look like anti-Semitism. It looks like a kind of pluralism, but in its contemporary manifestation, we'll see it for what it is. So let's shift from Paul to Martin Luther. Many people do not know Luther, really one of, probably the most influential person in the millennia, um, and rightly so. Um, people do not know about his work called The Jews and Their Lies. And it's online, I recommend you take a look at it. it it's, it's every time I read it, and I know, of the, I know of its existence, and I read it almost every year, I'm shocked by it. But what will happen, this is just an excerpt from it, what will happen even if we do burn down the Jew synagogues and forbid them publicly to praise God, to pray, to teach, to utter God's name? They will, you see Luther's like psychology, he's nuts, right? They will keep doing it in secret. And that very knowledge that they're doing it in secret, Luther cannot live with that. If we know that they are doing this in secret, it is the same as if they were doing it publicly. For our knowledge of their secret doings and our toleration of them implies that they are not secret after all. And thus, Luther's putting right on the table, our conscience is encumbered with it before God. The basis of anti-Semitism, I mean, I, I said to my students to whom I was teaching the Gospels and Paul, you can, and Augustine, you cannot teach the origins of Christianity without teaching the origins of anti-Semitism. It happens at the same time, because Christianity defines itself 
in relationship to a Judaism that it rejects. And the Pharisees and the scribes that are described in the Gospels, they don't know how to read their own texts. So, part, so there's, an, and we see in Paul, an enormous anxiety about the presence of the Jews, right? So on the one hand, Paul in this moment is expansive universalist, and the very existence of the Jews for Luther is problematic. This is replacement anti-Semitism. Okay, yalla. So now we'll make it all contemporary. Let's start with the last one first. The angry white men of Charlottesville. And you'll remember that they gave hell Hitler salutes in Charlottesville. This was 2017. And giving a, 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 a hell Hitler salute, a fascist salute. Jews will not replace us, dude, right? <laughs> I mean, we're, again, it's the same anxiety, right? The continuation of the Jewish, Jewish people is a source of anxiety for Christians. It just is, right? So someone was commenting on social media that Republicans like have their, seem to like Jews a lot, but a lot of Republicans like Jews a lot because they think they're going to convert them, right? The Southern Baptist, whatever their, their mission statement is, includes the conversion of the Jews, because Judaism is the, a thorn in their side, right? The Jew is the continual refusal of the Christian story. We're sticking to ours. Thank you very much. It's always very important, I feel, when talking about progressive anti-Semitism, which is really the subject of our talk today, to remember that if you're only seeing one side of the story, if you're pointing your finger to the right and saying, oh, they're the real anti-Semites, or you're pointing to the left and saying the same thing, you're missing the picture. It's the whole thing. They are codependent. And it's funny sometimes how extremists agree with one another. Fascists and communists had a lot that they agreed upon in the 20th century. So it's not surprising that we see anti-Semitism on both extremes, but it is part of, and we should remember this, it is part of the same phenomenon. Right? We, can't, we can't not be diligent about monitoring anti-Semitism on the right. It takes a very, very different form. And in a way, progressive anti-Semitism for many of us is most disappointing because the institutions that we affiliated with once, if we're older like me, and which um, were built on liberal principles of toleration, have now been taken over by this orthodoxy. And I, I hate using the term because I don't like these terms, but let's use it even as a shorthand, a woke orthodoxy in which there is no room anymore for liberal toleration. And, and that I feel very much that it's like a betrayal. I was raised in universities. I was raised in institutions which had democratic values. And now those democratic values are be being taken away. And that's why I think we're also concerned with the progressive ram the progressive manifestations of anti-Semitism. And not only that, and this is what ISCAP does and what Charles is leading on, is showing the way that the university world is not a is not a closed ecosystem, as people like to say today, right? It's part of a much bigger culture and its influences are enormous. And that's why really every talk we give at ISCAP, it's true, what we do is academic, but it is a call to action. It's a call to writing, it's a call to raising consciousness. It's a call to being part of the community that we're shaping today. Um, okay, so now we move on to uh, another event from 2017. Some of you may be familiar with this. This was the Chicago Dyke March. What was notable about this, this was um, a march for lesbian rights. Some people showed up, you see them here, with um, rainbow flags and Mug and Davids on them. And they were told, thank you very much, you are not welcome in this community, right? We just saw Charlottesville is Luther, right? The anxiety, you will not replace us. The Chicago Dyke March is, yeah, we tolerate everybody, but you, right? Neither Jew nor Greek works out much better for the Greek than the Jew, right? The Jew, in order to become the Greek, gets assimilated. Sorry, the Jew, in order to become the Greek, gets assimilated within the Greek. 
So, and, and that's one of the, the bizarre paradoxes that we have to point out that this new doctrine of intersect, intersectionality, it does not include the Jew. In fact, and it's not an incidental or accidental exclusion. The Jew is the basis upon which all of this woke universalism is based. In a way, just like, just like Christianity defines itself in relationship to the Jew, woke intersectionals also define themselves in relationship to the Jew. You know, it's the tell to find anybody who fits into this orthodoxy, meaning somebody who no longer is thinking for themselves, the tell to know that they are part of this woke orthodoxy, of course, there are other orthodoxies as well, also not good. Um, how can we tell they're part of this woke orthodoxy? The tell always is Israel-Palestine. That's always the tell. There's no wokeness without the anti, without the BDS component. It, it always comes together. Maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that. Another example of this was the food truck, the Moshava food truck, a Philadelphia uh, food, food festival. Um, and the guys who made falafel were told, or really the Israelis who made falafel were told, find another place, right? Again, this universalistic gesture and the Jew is excluded. I mean, it's funny because, I mean, if you're on social media, we're accused of stealing all of our cuisine from people, right? Christianity basically stole our scriptures, right? And we stole a falafel. Give us a break, right? I mean, the cultural appropriation that Jews have suffered is greater than any other group. And what's, what's, I mean, what's extraordinary about us is, unlike minority groups today, is when we had the opportunity in a majority culture, a non-Jewish culture, we said, we wanna learn all about your culture. We wanna become experts in your culture. You know how many English professors are Jewish? And they all are studying Christian texts. We didn't cancel Milton. We didn't cancel Shakespeare. Anyway, that's the, that's the success of, our, of, of us as a people because we deal with reality and we move on. Anyway, so here is another instance of this universalism which shows itself when it excludes the Jew. Now, there are many ways to continue this story. And for those of us who were together in, um, in Oxford or Cambridge, in Cambridge, we took a kind of, we veered off to discuss Edward Said, who was really a very important and critical aspect of anti-Semitism in the contemporary univer university because of his role, not only in creating new departments, Middle Eastern studies departments, but also he was in an English department. He was in the department where I studied at Columbia. And you could see the way in which he built networks, which are thriving today of anti-Semites in the academy. Today, I wanna to focus on a different figure. And this is, some of you may recognize him. Anybody recognize him? This is George Steiner. George Steiner is a very well-renowned literary critic, a polymath, master of many languages. Um, he's the kind of guy you read in graduate school and say, he's really smart and I'm not sure I really understand everything that he writes. Some of his work is extraordinarily brilliant. And I want to focus on him today because he became or he wrote in 1986, a kind of playbook for contemporary anti-Semitism. He himself is Jewish. Now, I'll, I'll situate this first by talking about T.S. Eliot. We'll quote him in a second. T.S. Eliot, I don't know when he wrote this, in the 40s, I think. He wrote notes, to, maybe even after the Holocaust, notes towards the defini definition of culture. I'm just showing you this because Steiner, he writes a book called In Bluebeard's Ca Castle towards called some notes towards the redefinition of culture. So Steiner, and he's, he's got the guns, he's got, he can actually stand up to T.S. Eliot. He's a serious guy. Um, but we'll talk about the strategy that he has in this book, which is a, an amazing book, which people should read and his other work on anti-Semitism. So let's toggle down here. Um, so 
we'll start with this. We're speaking about George Steiner's contemporary primer for self-hating Jews. Well, here's Eliot, not notes towards the definition of culture, but a work that he had to suppress because of what he writes here called After Strange Gods. So Eliot here, as he's interested in, and this makes him interesting, he's interested in what, what does it take to build a thriving community? But you'll see as far as Eliot is concerned, whatever thriving Christian community he's building or wants to build or is idealizing, it does not include Jews. The population should be homogenous, where two or more cult, you see how backwards this guy is, right? I mean, he missed the boat of the 20th century, where two or, and certainly the 21st, where two or more cultures exist in the same place, they are likely either to be fiercely self-conscious or both to become adulterate. Whoa. What is still more important is unity of religious background and reasons of race and religion combined to make any large number of free thinking Jews undesirable. <laughs> any any free thinking Jews in the room? I mean, why is why is Eliot just as the kind of side thing? Why is Eliot interested in free thinking Jews? Well, you know, why not Orthodox Jews? I mean, it seems to, you know, people go say, oh, we like Orthodox Jews, right? I mean, I think for, for Eliot, Jews represent, and I, you know, Eliot's always on to something. There is no true toleration in Europe until the Jews are emancipated. That The beginning of toleration is the emancipation of the Jew. We are the other, emancipate us, other others will follow, right? Um, and that's like, and that, that, um, that status of not being inside and being on the outside, well, we Jews, we, we are free thinking and we tend to do it, we Jews do, which is we think a lot and we, we take a critical perspective on things, right? And once you take that critical perspective, oh my God, it's contagious, right? The, the Jews are infecting us. That's what's happening in the Arab world today, right? The Jewish, Israel is a state that is corrupting the morals of the Arab world. Okay. So that's Eliot, and you can see why Steiner is really, really interested in um, wanting to, to provide some more notes. So for Eliot, the Jew is excluded. Steiner's story, and this is the story that he tells in In Bluebeard's Castle, and I'll just tell you very, very briefly, is Steiner's argument is that anti-Semitism is built into Western culture, Western history. And the reason is, is because the Jew enters into history with a ethical and moral perspective. And that, and that ethical perspective is too much for Western culture to bear. So it just kills it, right? We cannot live up to that ideal. Pagan world, we can't live up to that ideal. So we must kill the Jew. Steiner wants to see this as going, from Moses through Jesus to Marx to Freud. There is always the Jew standing there and, and, and lecturing to you. So Steiner's argument is, contra Eliot, you want to talk about Western culture, you have to focus on the Jew. Now let's keep this emphasis in mind as we look at Steiner's 1986 article called the Jewish homeland. Let's just pause 30 seconds and we can all, one of the things that I learned during COVID is it's okay to pause for 30 seconds during class. So we're gonna do that and I'm gonna have some water and we'll think about the title of this article. Okay, good. Guess what? The Jewish homeland, it's not Israel. So let's start reading him. And let's we'll see the argument that he's constructing. We'll see that for Steiner, the homeland is not the place of Israel, but the homeland is the place of Jewish culture. Steiner wants to take the wandering Jew and have the wandering Jew be the archetypical, the, 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 the paradigmatic version of the Jew. And anybody who betrays the values of the wandering Jew, which we'll see in a second, the cosmopolitan wandering Jew, anybody who betrays that in Steiner's weird version of tradition betrays the Jewish tradition. 
This is another thing when you read it for the first time, it's shocking, really. The Jewish homeland, and you'll see it gets more and more so. The millennial dialogue with God, of which the book of God is only the most, I mean, he, he overwrites, is only the most pointed protocol is that of a bookkeeper. Now, anybody who spent more than five minutes in a yeshiva or a midrashah or a seminary knows this is not true. So Steiner, in order to make the argument that he is making, is turning Judaism into a particular kind of particularism. We'll, we'll come back to why that image is not appropriate. Let's just read the end. This image can be pressed closely. God keeps book, sofeh, on his people. He's not a Hebrew scholar. Who are everlastingly the debtors to his initial advance. The accountant, so the Jew is the accountant and the bookkeeper. So all those people are learning in Yeshivot, especially around Jerusalem, they're all bookkeepers. Who uh, The accountant is by virtue of this, this custody accountable to God as to no other tribe. And Ezekiel, oh, he finds a Pusik, he finds a verse. And Ezekiel, the, this keeps keep of books, this clerkship to eternity takes on a grotesque physical vehemence. I think it might be where Ezekiel is feeding fire. Somebody look it up and you can tell us at the end, right? But you see how perverse this is? That he finds one verse from Ezekiel, which is not a normative, one of the normative prophets at all, right? And he's using that as a description of Jewish tradition. There is a very strong tradition, even in scholarship today, that looks at at, at the Hebrew Bible or Jewish tradition as replication. There's a guy named Robert S. Paul, uh, named appropriately, um, and he has this whole book on Judaism and, and, and Moses, where he defines Judaism as or what we call Mesorah, tradition as replication. What's the difference between tradition and replication? Replication is I copy something out over and over again, and I save it that way. It's like I'm, I have a hard drive. The Jewish tradition is not like that. It, that, is not how, that is not how the rabbis of the Talmud construct and understand Jewish learning. And in a way, the rabbis invent a kind of learning which was repeated later on in the Renaissance by Christian humanists. And what they did was, is they said, we're going to go back to something old, and we're going to make something new. That's very, very different than replication. For the rabbis, they're going back to the sacred text, the Torah. They're bringing it into their present. That's the oral law. The Christian humanists are doing something different, also heroic. What they're doing is going back to the Greek and the Latin and bringing it into their present. Tradition always has that present and future aspect. And what Steiner is doing here is erasing that right? It's just bookkeeping. It's just keeping. The Jew is a cleric. The mystery and the practice of clerisy are fundamental to Judaism. No other tradition or culture has ascribed comparable order to the conservation and transcription of text, an equivalent mystique of the philosophy. He's a jerk, right? This is a guy who really knows a lot. He's just being a jerk, right? Amy, he's a jerk, right? I mean, this he's describing Jewish tradition as if it as as if we're talking about the 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 scroll of the book in at the, Jew, at the at the Israel Museum where that's actually what they do is they conserve old texts, but Jewish tradition is alive even though I'm aware it is often betrayed in its practice, but Jewish tradition is alive when it has that creative aspect. And Steiner wants to create a Judaism, a particularism, interestingly, which he also is going to be able to reject in the name of a universalism. Here he goes on, he's still praising the cleric. The sole citizenship of the cleric is that of a civic humanism. He knows not only that nationalism is a sort of madness, a virulent infection, it's a, a word that's often used to describe anti-Semitism, I mean, to describe what Judy, Jews, a virulent infection edging the species towards mutual massacre. He knows that it signifies an abstention from free and clear thought and from a, the disinterested pursuit of justice. The man or woman at home in the text is by definition a conscientious objector the vulgar mystique of the flag and anthem to the sleep of reason which proclaims my country right or wrong, the vulgar mistake of the flag and anthem. 
I guess I will not be inviting him to my Yom Ha'atzma'ut barbecue. I mean, he's passed away, but he would not be particularly fond of celebrating Israeli nationalism. Now, what's interesting, and this is common to anti-Semites worldwide, especially today on the left, what, what, I, 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 you know, people in, at the Park Slope food co-op, I always like to tweet them, to add them to my tweets. People in the Park food, uh, Slope food co-op are not protesting the Ugar uh, uh, Holocaust or, or uh, which is happening in China. But everybody takes their anxieties about the nation state on Israel. Let's face it, people. The nation state is built on blood. Aeschylus knew this in ancient Greece, right? You cannot found the nation state without making limits. There's always violence to the nation state. No, and that's just a fact of life. And it makes us anxious. And of course, we're not happy about violence and we try to reduce it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But people's anxiety about the nation state gets expressed in relationship to Israel. Israel is a nation state to the utmost degree. Now, of course, this is written in 1986. It's a totally different time. It's before the Berlin Wall falls, right? We can certainly think of other nation states today, which are, are far better qualified as a nation state to the utmost degree. But with that said, it's Israel that's always pointed out. Let's, let's express our anxiety about the nation state. What is that anxiety? Well, that we've built it on maybe the, on, on, the land of others, through the blood of others. America does not have a very happy history in that respect, right? It fails in both counts. Taking away land and 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 turn and 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 uh, making a, a people subservient. So then Steiner goes on. There is no singular vice in the practice of the state of Israel. Oh, Baruch Hashem, right? We don't have one singular vice. These follow ineluctably. I would advise all scholars and PhD students never to use that word, ineluctably. These follow ineluctably on the simple institution of the modern nation state, on the political military necessities by which it exists with and against its nationalist competitors. Here, Steiner just said what I said. It's being a realist. It is empirical need that a nation state sups on lies, but you, know, so you see Steiner, he's already distancing himself from it. He wants no part of these lies. Where, has it, where it has traded its homeland in the text for one of the Golan Heights or in Gaza, Eilis was the clairvoyant of the great Hebraist Milton. Milton wrote a poem called Samson Agonistes, and he described Samson, Shimshon, as Eilis in Gaza, the sentence doesn't even make sense. Judaism has become homeless to itself. I said before, now look what Steiner is doing here. You know, this is this is the the one of the refuges of the left-wing Jew in the university. That is, we we express Judaism in the purest way because we are people of the book and we will not be sullied by history and land. It's a, very, it's a very easy way of avoiding responsibility. It's a very easy way also of justifying a difficult career path when everyone surrounding you is preaching an orthodoxy which marginalizes your people. Now we're really at the heart of what happens in the, in the university. I was at the Institute uh, for Advanced Studies at the Hebrew University last year. And during the year, I met many, many people, some very good scholars and teachers. But I also was fellows with people for the whole year and met fellows coming from all over the world, either on Zoom or in person. And I saw the extent, first of all, they, they're, they're like in their own, they're, they're entirely in their own reality. Their conversations about Israel-Palestine have no reference whatsoever to anything that's happening here. I, I, I was part of a, a, a conference 
on the representation of the senses in Renaissance England. And one of the young women there, who was just fits the type of the scholar I just described, had invited her advisor. And she managed to include the expropriation of Palestinian lands in a talk on Hamlet. And I, 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 I'm not joking. She actually did this. So at that point, I, I walked out and I went downstairs to the lunchroom. And I sat down with two people, some both notable in the Israeli world, somebody on the extreme left who was put in jail for a month for deserting the arm, for not serving in the territories. Another person who is more well known, who unfortunately uh, has his son is in uh, is, is still in, in Aza, his remains, Hadar, Hadar, whatever, anyway. And the two of them, they could not be further away from each other politically. But they're sitting and talking in a way that's reasonable. Right. And I told them what happened upstairs and they both thought it was hysterical. So the American world, it's, it is totally its own ecosystem. And it's so much informed by ideas that really come from Steiner, which encourages a fantasy version of Judaism. Right. I don't have to face the obligation, you know, what. And, and why, you know, it, it, people in America say, you know, excuse me if I'm offending anybody, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not referring to anybody here, but right? people in America will say, we, we have the right, we're Jews to talk about the state of Israel. Well, really? I mean, you know, what are your obligations? You don't have to live here, right? Are you part of any organization? Are you, do you speak up at your shul, at your whatever, not even your shul? Do you, are you part of some social group? Are you part of ISGAP? Are you, might, if, if you're not, I don't want to hear your, I don't want to hear your position. It's just laziness and virtue signaling. You see, this really for me hits very close to home. And again, because a lot of the people who I know, who you expect more of, even family members, right? You see them being pulled into this, into this, um, this pit of, of BDS, unconscious anti-Semitism, because that's just the culture. Let's read a little bit more of Steiner. Uh, that there is some, here we go, here's the particularity part, right? That there is some exemplary meaning to the singularity of Judaic endurance. That there is some sense beyond contingent or demographic interest to the interlocking constancy of Jewish pain and Jewish preservation. And get this, the notion that the appalling road of Jewish life and the ever renewed miracle survival should have as their end, as their justification, the setting up of a small nation state in the Middle East, crushed by military burdens, petty and even corrupt in its politics, shrill in its parochialism, is implausible. Look how we here in Israel have disappointed the Jewish intellectual, right? Edward Said says he's the last Jewish intellectual. They're both the last Jewish intellectual in a way. Steiner in his way and Sa Said in his way, in their claims, right? Steiner is saying, really, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm out. I'm out here. The only thing that distinguishes the Jew is, is the particularity of suffering. And it's interesting that there is some sense beyond contingent or demographic interest to the interlocking constancy of Jewish pain Right. And I, I just, he, he, the miracle of survival. I mean, it, it sneaks in into his prose. But we hear, and this gets back to responsibility, we feel responsibility to that continued miracle. All of us, right? And we know that the means for achieving that are very very, very, the, 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 the tools we have are very limited right now because the forces against us are so powerful and so strong. Um, but, and, and that's, you know, that's when you go back to the rabbinic dictum, just because you can't complete the task doesn't mean you can give up on it. And I think, and, and we have to really realize that for millennia, that's how Jews lived. They lived under the sense that we are done. The Christians have taken over. Right? We have to remember that. You read the Rav David Kinchi, a commentator on the Tanakh. His whole commentary on, on Psalms is about being in Galut. That is the defining nature of his experience. 
And it's not only that he can't raise the Israeli flag, is he has no status as a human, as a citizen. So we have to remember that and how hard fought that miracle is and our responsibility to those people and our tradition. And here's the kicker from Steiner, the last one. What I am asking is this, this is unbelievable. Might the Christian West and Islam, 1986 people remember this, might the Christian West and Islam live more humanely, more at ease with themselves, if the Jewish problem were indeed resolved, that endloshang of, or final solution, I mean, if any non-Jew did this, they would be pilloried, right? Would the sun of obsessive hatred of pain in Europe, in the Middle East, tomorrow it may be in Argentina or South Africa where the infection that spreads, but it's not the Jews, it's Israel now, right? Be diminished. Is liberal erosion is intermarriage, and here he's finally, he's on board now with Elliot. Is liberal erosion, is intermarriage the true road? I do not think the question can simply be shrugged aside. Has the survival of the Jew been worth the appalling cost? Would it need be, be, not be preferable on the balance sheet of human mercies if he was to ebb into assimilation and the common seas? From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, right? So, you know, this is, as I said, a kind of primer. I don't know if anybody even reads it, but in a way, this is kind of interesting, Charles. This is what we really have been doing with the Follow the Money Project, is a piece like this gets absorbed in the culture, right? Somehow. Somehow it just gets absorbed. So I don't know even know how much it's cited, but it does represent a perspective. Steiner was very much before his time. And you know, talking about our overarching theme, which is to provide a different kinds of descriptions of contemporary antisemitism, one of the things that we have discovered is there is a continuity between the Christian universalism of the past and the Christian universalism of the present. You really want to annoy somebody who's woke, call them a Puritan, because that's what they are. These are the people that Shakespeare makes fun of in Twelfth Night, Malvolio, right? He's a Puritan. Get, you know, get over yourself. Get over yourself a little bit. We, we have, we, but of course, on left and right, we have, we have lost our sense of humor. But with that, maybe we'll, we'll end now. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to, to entertain them. So, William, th thank you very much. It was a brilliant presentation, as always. So thank you. Um, I'm going to take the, the prerogative of the chair to ask you a question. Um, you, you sort of, you pointed it and you describe and examine and analyze um, I guess the embeddedness, if I can say that, of anti-Semitism in Western yeah. Christian yeah. civilization. Right. So, so you, you point to uh, the anti-Semitism in Charlottesville, the woke anti-Semitism in academia. Right. So are you pointing to sort of a deep-seated, uh, embedded anti-Judaism in Western Christian civilization? And if you are... Yeah. How does this relate to creating a conceptual framework? How does this, how does your analysis? Uh, uh, well, listen, I, I, first, I, first, I, I first, sorry, I, I just don't want to be so pessimistic about Christianity because there are people like my friend Giles Frazier and there are Christians and Jews, I think, who, I'll come back to your question, I think. Okay. But I think for us right now, it's very important for us to show our affiliations with Christians and Muslims who are interested in creating a tolerant multicultural society. And part of that tolerant multicultural society has to be one that includes religious people, right? Um, so I, I, I do wanna move forward with that sense of a, a liberalism, which is really totally based on Jewish values on the Old Testament, right? Um, the founding fathers do not just quote the, the Hebrew scriptures because they feel like it, right? There's a reason that many of the liberal values that we cherish come from those works. But for sure, listen, I, I think the study of, as I said, the study of Christianity cannot happen without the study of anti-Semitism. So there are people, I think, Charles, and I think this emphasizes what we want to do as a group, to look at the long durée of, yeah, thanks for that, to look at the long durée of, of, of anti-Semitism and Christian culture by long durée is not just focus on specific times or periods, but to really see something endemic to certain strains of Christianity, 
right? It, things have been changing since Vatican II. But I mean, it's not, it's still pretty recent, right? So I think we simultaneously want to be mindful of that history of Christian anti-Semitism, but to also do it in such a way that we think about our project together as a monotheistic one. I think the way we rescue culture today and civilization is emphasizing the liberal basis or, or common denominator of our monotheisms. That, that's obviously a different story. But I, I do want to to okay. frame the discussion of Christianity with with that with that qualification. Okay, so we're going to take some questions, but I'll just leave you with a thought. While you were presenting yeah. Steiner, there are scholars in the world of studying anti-Semitism who are actually the you know students and disciples of Steiner, and and kind of adopt in a very subtle mm -hmm. way his sort of worldview, which is interesting. And because we're conceptually yeah lacking. In, I think the study of critical contemporary anti-Semitism studies, many of the scholars engaged in the study of anti-Semitism mm -hmm. are oblivious to that factor, which is ah, interesting. Interesting. Um, yeah. And then I'll just make one more point and then open up to questions. Yeah. If, you're, if you're looking for a monotheistic kind of liberalism yeah. or toleration, I don't know, I would hold by Maimonides when it comes to notions of monotheism and Christianity, but that's a, a whole other can of worms. All right. So we Charles, should do a panel on that also, Charles. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, idolatry, but anyway. Yeah. So uh, let's start with one of the Wolf Fellows, Chloe. Hi, Chloe. Well, actually, actually, okay, Chloe, I want to call him Charles Jacobs. Nice to see you, Charles, and then Chloe. Okay. Oh, so Charles, you're in charge, yeah. Okay. Well, this was fa uh, fantastic, and I'm, uh, I've am i missed too many of these, and I won't any longer. This was really great. Um, I want to go back to your description of the nation state as inevitably something that has to be bloody. I mean, I believe that it, there are no virgin births uh, to Christian states. I can't imagine any nation state that one could name, uh, which was which didn't consist of one people taking land over from another. Um, mm -hmm. And so, if that's it, maybe there's some Micronesian island somewhere. But I remember when I was in New Zealand, and they they're in love with the Maoris, who they think they, you know, they colonialized, and then the Maoris came over to New Zealand and ate the people who were there before them. So I, I haven't Honestly. found the Micronesian state that there was a virgin birth nation. So, but, but if that's true, then the charges against Israel uh, are at least disproportionate, right? And the definition of anti-Semitism is the disproportionate concern with Jewish conduct. So these Jews on the left, who who don't want to be tainted by history and uh, and who don't want to be tainted by having a nation state is it fair to call them jewish supremacists that they think that we have to be better than other people so you know steiner wants us to disappear so that other people can have this nation their nation states but they're also nasty so are are these other people can we, is it fair to call these other Virtue, virtue spewing Jews, Jewish supremacists, yeah. that they demand that we be better. I mean, I, I kind of, I else. hear it. I, I kind of hear it, what you're saying. And it's, I, I just, I don't, I don't like to pile on with the, the, the labels. I, I hear that it works. I would say also Steiner's a little bit different. I think he's saying to the Christians, we gave you all this good stuff. You take it now, right? We can't handle it, right? We can't handle all this moral stuff. You do it because like it gets tied up for us in a country and a state and barbed wire so you know, uh, we'll we'll just bow out. I think the distinction you make, um, uh, Charles, is a very good one, though. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Chloe. Yeah. Sorry. Chloe, and then uh, Judy, Judy will be after Chloe. Hi. Thank you so much. I so enjoyed it. Um, and I'll just say really quickly, if you are looking for topics on the question of humor in these conversations, please do come to my talk next week because we will be looking exactly at humor um, mm. in the show, the rehearsal. Um, so my question actually comes from something you just said, William, uh, you spoke about reclaiming culture. And I think that the question of culture has been um, gestured towards in your talk, but I'd like to focus more on the definition of culture, specifically a Jewish culture. And you mentioned um, T.S. Eliot and um, notes towards a definition of culture. And I was wondering, please, could you also situate um, your discussion of Steiner with yeah. reference to T.S. Eliot's notion of culture, particularly a modernist culture, an individualist culture, a I feel, literary I, oh, I, feel, I feel like this is my orals exam, Chloe. This feels like my comprehensive. I think it's important. 
<laughs> no, I, I hear what you're saying, and you're raising so many very, very important questions. I mean, I, I think they're too much to, to really to deal with in some sense, but I think part of what we as Jews are doing in the different communities of which we are a part is reclaiming that center. There was so much that we used to be able to kind of disagree about without killing each other. And what's changed, I think, especially in America is, is that the extremes have taken over to the extent that that middle, that middle place of peaceful disagreement, I don't even know if it's re uh, resonant for you, Chloe. When I grew up in America in the 70s and 80s, it wasn't great. I mean, but there was the sense that we could live with our disagreement and there was conversation that happened within that. And I think we need, obviously, an expansive notion of Jewish culture that acknowledges different kinds of observance, different kinds of responsibility, different kinds of commitment to the Jewish people, right? We're not, we're not standing with entry cards. Now, what you said in relationship to Steiner and Elliot, I, I thought I, I thought I mentioned it, that I think that Steiner is is saying, let me take over now. And he Elliot says, well, the Jews can't be part of our story. And then Steiner says, no, really, you don't know, but the Jews are the central part of the story. And by 1986, this is uh, the, the lectures at Bluebeard's Castle were 1972 at Yale. By, by later on, by 1986, he's just given up on the Jews altogether. He sees, he sees that Jewish moralism, what it's done, he's very into his own argument. And he says, we have to pull away because people just, we, we, we want, we want, maybe it's just survivalist. I don't know if it's supremacist, maybe survivalist. Anyway, a short answer to your complex question. Thanks. Chloe, you want to follow up with anything? I'll let other people. Okay, okay. Uh, we'll, Judy, talk, we'll talk, Chloe, we'll talk. Judy, thank you. Uh, you're muted, Judy. So you're still, there you go. Are you? No, oh, you're still muted. What are you calling? Can you call me now? Yes, uh, we, we can hear you now, Judy. Go for it, and then and then and then Asher, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, no, I just want to make a couple of comments because uh, you know this is my field, and I've been in it for over sixty years. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, Judy, where are you? For where are you? Where are you a scholar? Uh, well, I worked thirty-three years at the American Jewish Committee, and I wrote some of the documentation that was sent to the Second Vatican Council. Nice. which they say uh, helped result okay. in the adoption of Nostra Aetate. So, Amazing. you know, and I've been credited with that by, by the Vatican. Um, but um, the point I wanted to make is that initially, from the first century on, the church and, and Christianity tended to define Jews as the deniers of a religion, <clears throat> you know, not as yeah. the upholders of a religion, but as the deniers of a religion. So before the church and Christian uh, hegemony became anti-Semitic, it was, it was anti-Jewish. I mean, it was originally ideological mm -hmm. and it became anti-Semitic when when policies were adopted that uh, that isolated, uh, you know, put the Jews into ghettos, uh, there were right. riots, et cetera, is, et cetera. is a newer 19th century term, but yeah. Jew hatred has existed for millennia. Yeah. But, but the point is that anti-Semitism on the left mm. um, is clearly connected to hatred of Israel. And it's okay. not just, uh, it's a different kind of anti-Semitism. Yeah. It's, it's that the Palestinian narrative has been picked up, lock, stock, you know, completely. You, you know what, go, go, just to interrupt you, Judy, from Charles's question before, it's almost as if, and, and this is a little bit of metaphoric, but there's almost a sense in which anti-Semitism is something that Christianity has to express, and it just finds different vessels available to do that, right? And, 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 and that, I think, is, you can see it very clearly in some, I think, British Jewry, that there's a class of people who were, on both on the left and the right, 
who were anti who were anti-Semitic before the war, and now oh now we can express this in a different way. We can express it within relationship to Israel. Well, it, it, that's possible. I think that's also possible. But the point is, even, uh, there have been very positive statements adopted by a variety of church groups. I mean, yes, including I the Lutherans. Yes. And in, in terms of re, revisiting and redefining their relationship to the Jewish community. Yes, very yes, positive, for sure. very positive. For sure. But for Israel sure. is still the stumbling block, even mm -hmm. for the uh, the liberal church communities. And um, there are reasons for that. There are, there are technical reasons for that. <laughs> there are budgetary reasons for that, for the way sure. the way church the way church activities are financed within the church itself. So Judy, Judy, just thank you for coming more. Thank you for the comments. We just have, we, we have just time for one more question and I want to get Asher. We have another but, uh, half an hour. Thank you very much, Judy, yeah. We have another half an hour, by the way. It's okay, okay. It's a 90 yeah. minute session, yeah. So oh, it's a 90 minute session? Okay, yeah. so I better have another cup of coffee. All right, sorry, Judy, I cut you off. <laughs> Judy, do you, are you, is there anything else you'd like to say, Judy? No. No. Okay. Judy, can you hear me? Yes. Is there anything you'd like to say? Anything else? Or you're, you're good? Uh, hold on. Okay. Oh, I'm not muted. Okay. No, I just want to thank you for a very, very interesting uh, experience. And, um, you know, I've followed ISGAP the best I can. And um, look, I'm, I'm in my 90s and I'm still working. I work for God the... Bless. Tannenbaum yeah. Center for Interreligious <clears throat> Understanding, and um, and I, um, I, you know, this has been my life's passion. I've spent a, a tremendous amount of time trying to clarify the Jewish Christian relationship um, historically and uh, and theologically. And, but to see that it has been corrupted by a certain hostility to Israel. You, you know, know, we should actually, Charles, I think we should invite Judy to give a talk about her scholarly yeah. career. Right? Wonderful. So Judy, we'd be happy to be in contact with you, maybe through El Shaddai. <laughs> okay, Thank well, you. Thank you for contact being here. me soon because I'm leaving <laughs> for Australia in uh, about 10 days. <laughs> okay, we will. Uh, my, only, my only kid and my grandchildren live there. Nice. And I haven't been able to travel there for months, for years, nice. but I'm going. My little granddaughter, my <laughs> little teeny granddaughter, in you know, in the three years that I've been gone, has developed into a young woman, and she's going to be bat mitzvah. Uh, so I'm Mazalto. going for that. Mazalto. Okay. So, <laughs> all right. So, uh, and I was just with the Pope ten days ago, but that's another story. Here you go. Sure. Small world. Yes, uh, Judy, I hope uh, that your wonderful work with the Catholic Church can uh, easily transport itself to uh, the Orthodox Church. I want you to know that uh, be, be, uh, that uh, they still, in the, their catechism daily, refer to the perfidious Iudeus, the perfidious Jews who killed their savior. So uh, I, I'm very uh, much intimately uh, involved with uh, developments there. I, I haven't been a survivor of the Greek Holocaust uh, of, mm. of Jews mm. there. Um, the observation, again, I, I'm thrilled with the uh, presentation. Um, I, one observation is that uh, uh, a lapse, it took a lapse priest by the name of James Carroll a generation ago. I remember uh, the uh, impression, the deep impression he had on me reading Constantine's sword, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that more than anything else, uh, Christianity has done great evil to, to Jews for two, two millennia, uh, much more than uh, Muslims. Uh, ever did. Uh, okay. So that's one observation. The other is that uh, uh, the uh, it was the Jewish uh, soul 
who uh, who became the apostle Paul, who came mm -hmm. to preach to the uh, Salonican Jews in the synagogue to teach them a, a kind of Judaism light, no kashrut, no circumcision, yeah, right, just right. be yourself as you as uh, uh, Dr. Cord uh, suggested, uh, a more inclusive uh, kind of uh, religiosity. They listened to him and then they ran him off uh, and uh, he became the arch typical anti-Semite. Uh, um, it is strange. I encounter this, and I wonder whether you have also, among uh, certain uh, Orthodox uh, Christians, they de de deny the Judaism of their Savior. For example, they deny that he was born. Uh, 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 Sasha, you're, uh, you're 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 really right for for pointing this out. Um, it, I I just teach this, and and uh, there are. In, there are Renaissance paintings of the circumcision feast, right? Yeah. So I, I think Charles, we have to organize a panel with some of the scholars who and and people who have experience, like Asher and like and like um, Judy, really to hear about the history and how things have changed because their insights really are so 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 valuable. So thank you, Asher. Um, uh, Isabella. Hi everybody, and I apologize. I'm in the in the airport, uh, so it's a little noisy here. But um, sure. Bill, thank you so much for for a really interesting talk. And what really jumped out at me is when you talked about the discourse, the conversation that you heard in that conference, which was completely separated from reality. Right? People are just it's like the conversation has nothing to do with what Israel really is. And mm -hmm. I it jumped out at me because I've been thinking about it a lot in the context of my research into Soviet anti-Zionism. How essentially, not essentially, but in 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 reality, it's grounded in anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. And anytime you're in the realm of conspiracy theory, you're outside reality. And this worries me a lot, uh, you know, so I wouldn't dismiss it as, as the way your colleagues did, because I think that it's, once somebody in the world of conspiracy theory, really anything becomes possible. And to us, it doesn't matter, like, we can laugh at it, except that they proceed from their conspiratorial point of view, right? And they act upon us from the position of a conspiracy theory. And I'll talk a little bit about that. I'll, I'll be talking actually quite a bit about that, I think, in my talk. But I just wanted to point this out. It really jumped out at me. I think that's so interesting. So, I mean, maybe just you could talk a, a minute more about how things change when we look at left-wing anti-Semitism as a kind of conspiracy theory, meaning we never think of it. I mean, I don't think of it in that term. I use conspiracy theory to discuss people on the right in general, but you're saying it applies to the left as well. So that seems like a very interesting descriptor. Well, that's yeah. something that I, I've come to the conclusion. You know, I've written about it a couple of times. Most recently, I mentioned it in the piece about Mahmoud Abbas's dissertation. But before that, I had a paper. I, I'll be happy to send it to you. But I, 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 it's my conviction now that what we're seeing today, the the conversation, the because contemporary left wing anti Zionist uh, tropes are so completely, they match so closely, so fully, I would say, and the explanatory logic match their counterparts, uh, their Soviet counterparts, right? So we can talk about, okay, what was Soviet anti-Zionism? And Soviet anti-Zionism is come a conspiracy theory. When you look mm. at biographies of people who produced it, when you look at the influences, when you look at what were they drawing upon, when you read mm. all of the propaganda literature, it's nothing but conspiracy theory expressed in quote unquote Marxist-Leninist kind of anti-Zionist terms. And so mm -hmm. I believe that what the left is doing, this is increasing my conviction, that they are in the world of their own, in, in, in the realm of anti-Semitic conspiracy theory as ex expressed as anti-Zionism, expressed mm -hmm. in left-wing socialist, Marxist-Leninist, late Marxist-Leninist terminology. However, they, you know, everything is now distorted. But, but I do think that it would help us to play with this idea that what the left is doing is really engaging in, in, in a conspiracy theory, because I think it adds a new dimension for how we approach it, for how we fight it, and uh, and how we ourselves handle it. So we have to all come to your talk. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Important point. Thanks, Isabella. So Lena, Lena, and can you introduce yourself, please? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. 
Oh, hi. Uh, my name is Lena molokotos Sliderman. I'm an affiliated researcher with the Wolf Institute, but I now live abroad in Switzerland and I'm a sociologist of religion by training. And um, I'm currently, um, I also have a, another hat. Uh, I do research, but I also have a hat of the translator. So I'm actually currently translating uh, a book on from Greek into English because I'm uh, Greek originally married to someone Jewish um, from the US. Um, and I'm translating uh, this book on the history of the Jews of Greece from, from Greek into English. So I was very interested in uh, what Asher I uh, had to say, and so this is the book for anybody who <laughs> who speaks Greek. Maybe Asher does. Um, anyway, so um, I was... to, uh, what does it say? <laughs> the the roots yeah. of, of the Jews of Greece. On the, yeah, on the footsteps of the Jews of Greece. So right. it, yeah. Um, so my question is quite specific is um, there's a chapter um, at the end of the book which talks about current uh, attitudes in Greece towards Jews. And it describes mm -hmm. it as, as a complex of Judeophobia, um, combining um, uh, anti-Zionism, anti anti-Judaism, anyway, it's, it's complicated. Um, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts on um, a country like Greece, which has mm -hmm. a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of Jews living there because they were all decimated. Um, mm -hmm. When, uh, and if you look at various um, surveys, especially European surveys, Greece comes at the very top in terms of current anti-Semitic. Yes, one. exactly, number one. Um, and so I was wondering if you had any thoughts or, or anything on that, how you explain it or, or I don't know, any thoughts on it. So that's all. So, I mean, I, I think probably other people in our virtual room probably have more insight about it, but it sounds like your voice is very important to be part of this conversation because we're not going to find out about it from people in the room who don't live, maybe Asher and you, right? So it sounds like, you know, you should be part of our conversation and help us to understand why it is that in certain countries like Greece, although I understand that Greece has a real history of anti-Semitism even before yes. the war, right? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there are a lot of variables in play. So it'd be-, it'd be, it'd be And, 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 it, um, and of, obviously it's closely connected uh, with the role of the Greek Orthodox Church. So those mm -hmm. two are, you know, yeah. anyway, yeah. but yes, I, I would right, be- Thank you. You know, nice as, a, as a footnote to all this, growing up in Montreal, uh, in the suburbs of Montreal, there were Greek immigrants who came in the 1960s and 70s to Montreal, and there were we were kids. So there were Greek gangs that used to go and uh, kind of seek out Jews to beat them, and we had to we were trained by the JDL as 12, 14 year old kids, and the JDL from New York actually stopped the problem in our in our community. But it was it was a very we were it was very difficult for a few years. So, um, one, so I guess an example of um, you know Greek anti-Semitism among the diaspora. So yeah. not yeah, yeah, which is which is would be actually another interesting extension, not just in Greece but in the Greek diaspora. There are many more Greeks out living outside Greece than in Greece. Yeah. So, and okay. we knew actually so we lived near a Greek Orthodox church on Sundays. Uh, when the church let out, you you should not be on the streets, actually, mm. in Montreal. Well, yeah. uh, on a, on another occasion, I have an interesting story, which is how I married my my Jewish husband. I'm Greek Orthodox by birth. Uh, how we were able to to get married in 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 New York through having a, a rabbi and a Greek Orthodox priest co officiating the ceremony. It's an anecdotal um, story which um, says a lot. But anyway, you'll, you'll have to come back and share that with us. Yeah, no, no, I, I won't. I'll, I'll stop. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lena. I'm glad you're here. Thank you, uh, Shelley. Nice to see you. I think you're muted. Sorry. Hi. Uh, I have a tiny little, perhaps uninformed question or comment, uh, and perhaps for another time, but it, it, it was uh, it sort of birthed out of your talk, um, uh, Bill, and I, I genuinely appreciated your talk. It was a fabulous learning experience for me. Um, I'm interested in the cultural aspect, uh, perhaps to echo Chloe, but in a different way. Um, 
I've been immersed for a long time in with people, I should say, immersed with people, that's wrongly put, but in any case, I'm exposed to people and work with people who work in issues around diaspora culture. Um, internationally, we could say. I'm, you know, not everywhere necessarily, but in many different parts of the world. And I'm interested in that sort of collision or collaboration or conversation, the three C's perhaps, between uh, that cultural aspect of diaspora that in a sense wants to celebrate diaspora, which is a strange word, a strange way of uh, describing it, but at the same time, heightening the interest in diaspora culture, for example, versus, if we have to say versus, um, Israel and Israeli culture, let's say, uh, or the need for an Israel. Does it, does it promote further anti-Semitism? It's, a, it's a, a true question from me in the sense that I'm not entirely clear if it helps celebrate uh, Judaism internationally or if it actually contributes to the left-wing anti-Semitism necessarily, oh, let's say. You know, uh, well, it's, I think, it's very I think two, Right, I think there are two issues here. First of all, I would say in some sense, Israel is also a diaspora culture, and not because I'm a very religious Satmar Jew, not because of that, because we live in a culture and a multicultural context. I teach Arabs, Christians, Muslims, right? And whatever is happening in America or should be happening according to its ideals, which it no longer lives up to, in a way, some people are doing more of what, what should be done here in Israel. Now, I think what you're saying is that diaspora gets appropriated, right? I mean, it gets appropriated by those, and very often that appropriation will involve the marginalization of the Jew, right? Sure. So sure. when that, in fact, happens, when we talk about, uh, you know, I have a graduate student um, at bar Ilan who is writing her dissertation on uh, Palestinian American literature, and she's Palestinian. And she talks about the Palestinian diaspora, Palestinian exile. Is that a form of expression or a form of appropriation? I mean, I, I think we have to allow everybody to tell their stories the way they want to, provided they don't interfere with the telling of, of my story. But I think, you know, you're, you're in, in tune with the talk, and I see how it came out of what we were discussing today, is there are all sorts of ways in which non-Jewish groups appropriate Jewish language for their own agendas. You know, I mean, and the most vulgar of this, I know Diane works a lot on this, is, is the Black Hebrews, right? I mean, not the most vulgar in terms of their, just in, in the, the most kind of clunky way of doing it. Right? We are, in fact, you. I mean, talk about replacement theology, right? So there are all these ways, and I think diaspora may be one of those ways of appropriation of Jewish texts or Jewish practices. Uh, to be deployed against Israel. Thank you. Is it Charlie Rose? Charles Rose? I would just, I would just make one comment. First of all, I, I thought your your uh, talk was fabulous, but I think the I think the, the thing that we have to recognize is that we we have a world now that's legitimizing violence. Mm. In the legitimization of violence, the Jew becomes the centerpiece of that process. Mm -hmm. I think that when we are allowing all types of violence in democracies to escalate, there is no longer a democracy and a free market that is 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 suppressing okay. violence, but it's escalating you. violence. For sure, the Jew becomes the target of that violence at some point, and I think this is something that's very serious now. I think that the the escalation of domestic violence across many Western nations. Mm. is resulting in the Jew becoming the focus of this violence. And I think yeah. that... I, no, I, I, think I, that's I, I think that's the major... I, I, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, go finish your point, yeah. I think my point is that we have a society, what you said earlier about the hollowing out of the center, the mm -hmm. hollowing out of the center is the, is, the, is, the, is the crux of the problem across all democracies today. And oh, that I has resulted, and that has resulted in a legitimization of violence, and, and, and legitimization of the extremities of the left and the right. And this escalation of violence is what's fostering this anti-Semitic narrative of both sides. Are Are you a sociologist? No, I'm an I, I know, I'm a money manager. <laughs> I, okay, you know okay. you have but, practical you have practical skills. No, I mean you know if you want to hang around with people who will 
provide anthropological or sociological or cultural analysis of anti-Semitism and get really depressed, you're in the right company, right? Um, but I think part of ISCAP's or the energy that informs ISCAP is I, I hear you and I feel it every single day, but we just have to kind of renew our commitment and our responsibility. And ISCAP is an institution that is doing that, you know, across the board in the academy. And we have not only that, but we have seminars like this, which I think are important because I think, listen, money managers are people too, right? We want, we want to appeal to everybody and we're glad you're here, right? We don't, we, 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 we will never pander to, uh, to the language of social media, but we do want to engage with people who are genuinely interested and have a real commitment to, to Judaism, to Israel. The first, I'll tell you something, the first element of a successful investment is to analyze the people who are overseeing the investment process. Okay. And we are seeing a degradation of, 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 uh, of all types of behavior in the investment world that it's unprecedented. And this has been going on now for a generation. That's and this, this, this behavior, this, this misbehavior is being fostered across many, many variables. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I'm seeing, uh, which I've never seen this before, it's it's fostered in government, it's fostered in the investing public, it's fostered by shareholders, it's fostered across the world. Everyone's mm -hmm. in a me generation today. What can I do? Okay, right. We're, okay, okay. Let's That's not get too smart done. because we'll I'm get done. we'll get really depressed, Charles. I'm yeah. Done. All right. Thank you. Any anybody else has a comment or a question? Please feel free. No, William, do you have any final? No, I would just thank everybody for coming. And I think, you know, we're, 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 because of all of the great work that the ISGAP team has been doing over the years, we're really kind of an inflection point because we have these amazing studies coming out, which will show in the public sphere the way the universities are really um, tainted by dirty money, mostly coming from Qatar and other places. Um, so we have now a set of research fellows who are coming together and are more and more committed to the ISCAP vision. And it's very, very good to see everybody here. And I know Charles and I are really encouraging um, to us to kind of build on the community that we've already created. That would be more in terms of scholarly collaboration on publications, um, participating in our conferences, um, participating really in, in just the activity of thinking about how we can together combat what, you know, Charles just described as what seems like an insurmountable problem. But we know idealists are crazy. So, you know, welcome to the club. It's not insurmountable because we're still here. We're still here. Thank you. Thank God. Learning to study that, the mind that, of our enemies is to be also be empowering. We have to understand the mind of our enemy to have strategies to survive and to win. Asher, sure you get the last word. Yes, a, a concluding remark. Uh, Les Steiner uh, get uh, will get his last uh, reward of uh, not seeing uh, Jews around. Uh, there is, uh, I have spoken to the Anusim in El Paso, Texas, and it's a remarkable, remarkable uh, group of people who have rediscovered their Judaism they were part of the uh, of the Inquisition of the Americas, and they right. are coming back in droves. So it's amazing. I mean, right. good. I mean, we will, will you know, to live. you know, turning to back to synagogue, back to culture, making also, you know, Jude Judaism is not only for religious people. Okay, guys, Asher got the last word. Okay, I'll just say one more thing, please. Uh, we're sending out notices. We have the Oxford Summer Institute, so for scholars on the call, in early August, we have a two-week program at uh, Pembroke College at Oxford University, and we'll be uh, sending out, no Daphne will be sending out notices, so we're receiving applications for that. And we will have a program in the summer for a select group of scholars to kind of further explore this project of creating a conceptual framework to uh, deal with contemporary anti-Semitism studies. So thank you for being here. And Thanks, after next week, same time, same place.
Awesome. Ooh. Same time, same place, new scholar. Who's speaking next week? Uh, Chloe. You caught me off Chloe. guard. I believe Chloe's next week, same time. Yeah. She's talking about literature and anti Semitism. Yes, I would all I would encourage everybody who's here to, to come to this talk. Chloe really brings a very unique perspective to um to early modernism, that is 20th century literature, and to show the continuities between the anti-Semitism of poets during that period and how there's a continuity with anti-Semitism today. It's brilliant work and extremely engaging. So I encourage everybody to come. Thank you, William. Uh, William, thank you very much on behalf of everybody. It was a brilliant, as usual, a brilliant presentation. You. Your work is very important. Thank you, everybody. Have a good rest of your week. Thanks for being here.